Hello and welcome to this week's Beyond Biotech podcast. And it's the last one in July and it's podcast number seven. I'm Jim Cornell from thebiotech.eu, and it's been another busy week with podcast interviews, meetings, and of course, putting this podcast together. And it's a bit of a different one this week for two reasons. The first is it has a theme, and the second is that I didn't do any of the interviews. July 29th is a few different days. It's International Tiger Day, it's National Lipstick Day in the US, and it's also National Talk in an Elevator Day. I think the nearest elevator for me would be more than half an hour away, so I won't bother with that one, or for that matter, the lipstick one. It's also the beginning of the Islamic New Year, and yesterday, which was July 28th, was World Hepatitis Day to raise awareness of hepatitis. It's also Hepatitis Week from July the 26th to August the 1st, so this podcast is dedicated to interviews related to hepatitis. Who said there's no planning goes into the podcast? The other thing is that Liza Laws did all of the interviews for this one. I did do the editing, though, so that makes it feel like I've been involved. It really is good to be part of a team as opposed to doing podcasts all on my own. Although, having said that, it was a bit odd editing interviews that I'd not heard before, so it did take a little bit longer than usual. That's my excuse, anyway. Sadly, our house is now a little emptier again as the family is headed back to Canada, and our heat wave in Western Scotland lasted about a day and a half. We went from 27 down to wet and cooler. Today, I think we max out at 19, which is 66 Fahrenheit. And there's a flood watch on. So the less said about the weather, the better. It's a public holiday here in Scotland on Monday, but pretty much nowhere else. So I'll just work as usual. And, of course, by Monday, it will be August. Before we get to this week's news, and there really was a whole lot of it this week, I'll tell you who we have on the podcast. Our guests are Ahmed El Shakawi, consultant transplant hepatologist and honorary clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham in the UK, Ziv Benari, director of the Liver Diseases Center at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel, and James McElroy, CEO of Enterobiotics. And that brings us to the news from the past seven days that you may have missed over at labiotech.eu. So here we go. AGC Biologics announced a gene therapy partnership with Althea Science. Mission Bio launched a new cancer assay. And Biogen's new drug application for the first treatment of a rare neurological disease was accepted by the FDA. Step Pharma moved into oncology clinical trials. We looked at five companies personalizing treatments with 3D printed drugs, and we had an article on how vaccines can keep up with evolving COVID variants. The first of its kind multiple sclerosis biosimilar was accepted by the FDA. AbbVie is looking for a new indication for a Crohn's disease drug. T-cell therapy company Alovir is set to raise almost $130 million, and Diffusion Pharmaceuticals is starting a brain tumor clinical trial. Somalogic acquired DNA technology company Palamedrix. We had some updated articles, and Irish ag tech startup CropBiome received a 1.3 million euro investment. Deep Science Ventures deepened its relationship with Cancer Research UK to found some oncology startups. Oxford Biomedica set up a new project. And investment in health startups in the Spanish Autonomous Community of Catalonia has already overtaken the amount raised in 2021. An Israeli food tech company has developed zero-waste plant protein extraction, and we had an in-depth article on DNA sequencing and biodiversity loss. Ginkgo acquired Zymergen for $300 million. Bavarian Nordic got European approval to add monkeypox to the efficacy of its smallpox vaccine. And you can read all of these, and lots more, at labiotech.eu. Something I should mention, which I might not have in the previous podcasts, is that not only can you find this podcast wherever you download other podcasts and on our website, but you can also find Beyond Biotech on YouTube. We post all of the podcasts there, along with some images related to the interviews. So now we move on to the main theme for today, and it's hepatitis. 
The podcast is going out the day after World Hepatitis Day, but it is also Hepatitis Awareness Week. So before we get to the interviews, a few stats related to hepatitis. More than 350 million people around the world live with hepatitis B or C, according to the World Health Organization. The organization also says that 58 million have chronic hepatitis C infection and around 1.5 million more are diagnosed every year. Sadly, in 2019, around 290,000 people died from the disease. Okay, that's enough stats. Let's get to the first of the interviews, the first of which is a bit of an overview. It's with Dr. Ahmed El Shakawi, consultant transplant hepatologist and honorary clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham in the UK. And as I mentioned earlier, he was talking with Labiotech's Liza Laws. Sure. So uh, my name's Ahmed El Shakawi. I'm a consultant uh, hepatologist, that's a liver specialist in Birmingham in the UK. I am the former chair of the British Viral Hepatitis Group and the current chair of the Specialist Interest Group for Hepatitis B in the British Association for Studied Liver Disease. I have a long-standing interest in viral hepatitis and I really believe that viral hepatitis is something that we can eliminate as per the World Health Organization targets, but we've still got a long way to go. And so it's great to be talking to you uh, today about the World Hepatitis Day. That's great. And leading into that, could you explain a little bit about the theme for this year's um, World Hepatitis Day, which is I Can't Wait? So I Can't Wait is really a patient advocacy call to arms, if you like. And it's the fact that there are millions and millions of people infected with all forms of viral hepatitis around the world and people dying all the time. So it is estimated that every 30 seconds, one person dies of hepatitis related disease, often liver cancer, uh, and that's often in areas with poor resources like Africa. But if you imagine if it takes us 10 or 15 minutes to do this podcast recording, that will be 30 people dying in the time it takes us to record this podcast. And those are people who could have been saved with timely intervention, with treatments, with vaccination, and we can cover all that hopefully in the next few minutes. And so that's why I can't wait is a really important hashtag because people will die if we do not act. And the solutions are relatively straightforward. Yes, there are logistical problems. Yes, there are resource implications. Yes, there is lobbying to be done. But actually, we have the tools to really make a big dent into the number of deaths of people with viral hepatitis around the world. And that's why the hashtag I can't wait is really important. And just to sort of give a bit more information about um, the World Hepatitis Day, it's held on the same day every year, and it's to mark the birthday of Dr. Barrett Bloomberg. For those who don't know, who was he and um, what exactly was it that he did to earn his Nobel Prize? Sure. So he was an American physician. Interestingly, he initially wanted to study maths at university, but then changed to medicine. He then came across to Oxford and did a PhD in biochemistry at Balliol College and eventually became the master of Balliol College, the first American to be so. But he was interested in the genetic diversity of initially human beings and their pattern of disease. But then as part of his research work, discovered something called the Australian antigen, because he got interested in why people developed hepatitis, why they developed jaundice after blood transfusions in particular. And this was in the late 60s. And eventually he discovered that there was an infective agent in blood that could be transmitted by blood transfusions. And his work eventually led to the discovery of the hepatitis B virus. So he founded the Hepatitis B Foundation in the United States, which is probably the lead patient organization for hepatitis B advocacy in the world. And consequently, World Hepatitis Day, when they chose the day, they chose the 28th of July, which was his birthday in 1925. He died sadly in 2011, but he received his Nobel Prize in 76 for the discovery of infectious agents and how they spread. And also he was the first person to generate a vaccine against hepatitis B, which saved thousands and millions of lives probably. But there's still a lot of work to do. Impressive stuff. Indeed. Um, yeah. Quite a legacy. Obviously, there's, there's still stuff to be done. You mentioned earlier. What needs to be done to enhance awareness of hepatitis? And um, and also, if you could explain sort of what health problems it can cause that people may not be aware of. I think liver disease in general is poorly understood. 
amongst the world population in general. It is sometimes poorly taught. The awareness of liver disease, even amongst healthcare professionals, is often poor. Liver disease disproportionately affects younger patients, whichever form of liver disease that is, whether it be alcohol-related liver disease, whether it be liver disease related to obesity, whether it be liver disease related to autoimmune conditions, whether it be liver disease related to viruses, which is what we're talking about today. All those disease agents can cause hepatitis. And hepatitis just means inflammation of the liver. So all hepatitis is the description of inflammation in the liver. And what causes that is the cause. So when I talk about viral hepatitis, I'm talking about hepatitis caused by viruses. And around the world, there are mainly patients infected chronically, by by chronic, I mean long-term infections, with either hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus. And as we sit here in 2022, it's estimated that 300 million people around the world, it's about 5% of the world population, is infected with hepatitis B and about 70 million are infected with hepatitis C virus. And they're causing deaths all the time. Now, we've had great strides in terms of hepatitis C virus, in terms of now we've got a cure for it. The cure is relatively straightforward. It's an eight to 12 week course of tablets. And we've really been treating and curing people for the last six or seven years with these new agents. And with great, great strides in some countries are almost eliminating the virus as a public health concern. But hepatitis B is a lot further behind. We don't have a cure. We have treatment that suppresses the virus. And by by that, I mean it reduces the multiplication of the virus in the liver to virtually undetectable levels. And that prevents development of liver scarring, which is the consequence of all forms of hepatitis, whatever the causative agent. And when the scarring gets severe enough, you get liver cirrhosis. So everyone thinks of liver cirrhosis as only being caused by alcohol. That's not true. Anything that causes inflammation in the liver over a long period of time can cause cirrhosis. And the way I describe it to my patients is, if I was to take my hand and scratch it, I get redness. That redness is inflammation. If I was to take the same part and scratch it every day for a month, I'd develop a scar tissue. And the same process is happening in the liver over many, many years. And liver cirrhosis can lead to liver failure and or liver cancer. And that is what kills people with liver disease. Now, the problem or the issue, if you like, rather than the problem with liver disease, is it often doesn't cause many symptoms until it's too late. And part of that is because the liver is a fantastic organ. It's the only organ in the body that if you remove two thirds of, the third that's left will grow back to the same size and the same function as the liver that you've removed. And the liver is unique amongst the organs in the body in being able to do that, which means actually it's a good thing. Insofar as if you stop the injury to the liver, the liver can recover. And we often see people with really quite advanced liver cirrhosis caused by alcohol or caused by viruses. And when we treat the viruses or people stop drinking, often the liver can recover to quite significant function uh, that prevents them requiring any further treatments or prevents them dying. But the flip side of that is it causes very little symptoms until it's too late, until you've got cirrhosis. And when we look carefully enough, we do recognize that there are symptoms, but they're all very, very vague. And generally, people are very well until the end stages of liver disease, which is the difficulty. So actually, what we need to be looking at is not necessarily symptoms. We need to be looking at risk factors for liver disease and screening people for risk factors and testing them for viruses if they have risk factors for the viruses and then treating them accordingly once we screen them. And therein lies a the difficulty, if you like, in terms of liver disease and education and awareness. So there's nothing, once the liver is scarred, that scar tissue is in place, there's nothing that can be done to alleviate that scarring, is there? It's what you were saying. Well, no, there is. So when I was at medical school, which isn't that long ago, in the early 90s, if you like, we were taught that liver cirrhosis was irreversible. So once you got to the stage of severe scarring, and and we we measure scarring on a numerical stage where zero is no scarring and, and four is cirrhosis, And by cirrhosis, what we mean is that you are getting scar tissue that circles normal liver cells so that you're getting islands of scar tissue and islands of liver cells within the liver. And the liver looks very, we call it nodular. It looks like, looks a bit grisly. It's grisly, essentially. It's a bit like a gristle in a bit of meat, but you've got Mm -hmm. lots of gristle within the liver and therefore very little of the functioning liver cells in between. And that's cirrhosis, essentially. And so I was taught, at medical school that cirrhosis was irreversible 
But that's not true. We now know, for example, that if you treat someone with hepatitis B who's developed cirrhosis because they've been unrecognized, and by the time they're recognized, they've got cirrhosis. If you treat them with the drug to suppress the hepatitis B over five years, you can see improvement and going and reversal of cirrhosis. Now, that is if you've not gone too far. If you've gone mm-hmm. very far, then often you can't improve the scarring in their liver. So it's all a scale, if you like. But the critical thing is identifying people ideally before they get to that stage. And I work in a transplant center. And, and so we do liver transplants for people who've gone too far. And for me, actually, because the vast, vast majority of liver disease is preventable, even though I'm a great advocate of transplantation, to me, transplant is a failure of medical care mm-hmm. because we pick that patient up too late or we've not treated them adequately but mainly because we've not picked the patient, we've picked the patient up too late. So I think that's really important message to get across. Most of this is preventable. Most of liver disease is treatable. Some of it is, of course, related to lifestyle factors like alcohol, like obesity. But actually, a lot of those things we're starting to understand aren't lifestyle choices. A lot of those are addictions that we need to Mm -hmm. be addressing in different manners. But I'm going off tangent because we're talking about viral hepatitis mainly. So you're going back to viral, what um, symptoms, I mean, as you said, sometimes it can be too late and people don't necessarily know that they've got any problems until then. Is that the same with viral hepatitis or what can people look out for to maybe identify that they've got a liver that's in trouble through viral hepatitis? So I think often the symptoms are very vague, as I said, so a bit of tiredness sometimes, a bit of brain fog sometimes, a bit of joint pains and general aching sometimes. But the majority of people don't know that they've got it. It's picked up incidentally and or it's too late when they present with really advanced stages of liver cirrhosis. So they present, for example, with fluid retention or they present with the swelling in their tummy because the fluid in their tummy is accumulating or they present with the consequences of the liver being so scarred. Because the liver is very scarred, you get back pressure on the main vein that's draining into the liver from your bowels. So you can get the development of dilated veins around your bowels. And one of the consequences of that can be bleeding. If one of those mm-hmm. veins bursts at the bottom end of your gullet, then you can present vomiting blood. But that, again, is a very late stage of, of liver disease presentation. But sometimes that's how people do present. But the vast majority are, are haven't got many symptoms that they can really pinpoint. Maybe in hindsight, when you speak to them or you treat their viruses and their inflammation dampens down. So actually, I do feel a bit better, but that's not universal. And a lot of people we treat, for example, with hepatitis B treatments, tell us, I feel no different, but you know, you're preventing them having problems in the future. And that's really important. I guess one last question would be, um, you know, what, what do people hope to achieve from holding World Hepatitis Day? And is it something that people can get involved with? Or is it just all about highlighting and, you know, social media, that kind of thing? No, absolutely. We really need people to get involved with World Hepatitis Day. I think part of the issue we have around liver disease, but actually viral hepatitis in particular, is the stigma associated with the disease. So there are still lots of people who feel stigmatized, who feel unable to talk about the disease. We hear a lot of people being discriminated against because they've got viral hepatitis. Uh, We hear people not being able to get visas because they're infected with viral hepatitis to go and study or work abroad from their countries of origin. We hear of people being shunned by their families because they see, for example, hepatitis B as being a disease of sexual promiscuity. We haven't spoken necessarily about the modes of transmission, but actually the majority of people infected with hepatitis B around the world have acquired it at the time of childbirth from their mother because their mother's had hepatitis B, or they've acquired it as children if someone else in the family has got hepatitis B, or they've acquired it through unsafe medical practice. So the vast, vast majority of people who acquire hepatitis B around the world are acquiring it through those modes of transmission. Sexual transmission does happen, but it's rare compared to the other modes of transmission. With hepatitis C, again, depending on where you live, a lot of people do acquire it through intravenous drug use in the Western world. But elsewhere, a lot of it is unsafe medical practice, for example. And there are some countries where needles are reused because of resource implications. And for example, Egypt had a rate of hepatitis C in its population of upwards of about 5%. And that's because in the 60s, they used to treat a disease called schistosomiasis by going around the villages with the same needle and syringe and injecting one person from, you know, using the same individuals consecutively. And so actually the the virus spread like wildfire through that. So I think it's important that people understand that stigma is a big issue. And the more we talk about it, the less stigmatizing it is. And the more we normalize the discussion around it. But also people can get involved through social media. 
I'd refer people to the hashtag World Hepatitis Day 2022, or indeed Hepatitis Can't Wait, and organizations like the Hepatitis B Foundation, the World Hepatitis Alliance. They all have great websites and great ways that you can get involved. If you're self-infected, if you've got a family member, or you're just interested in public health and really want to get involved. Now we go to Israel for a conversation Liza had with Professor Ziv Ben-Ari, Professor of Medicine at Tel Aviv University and Director of the Liver Diseases Center at the Sheba Medical Center. Good morning, Ziv. I wonder if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. So I'm Professor Ziv Ben-Ari. I'm the Director of the Liver Disease Center at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel. This is one of the largest uh, liver centers in Israel. And most of our patients are patients with viral hepatitis as hepatitis B, C, and D. What are recent patterns showing with liver disease and hepatitis? And why do you think there's a rise? Well, I think the major reason for the rising incidence in chronic liver diseases currently are the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic liver disease, which are in rise in the Western world, in Europe and the USA due to the obesity around the world and really reduce physical activity. While the viral hepatitis, mainly a chronic hepatitis C, the prevalence is decreasing due to the introduction of the new antiviral agents. The chronic hepatitis B, the prevalence is quite stable. So the recent progress and things stabilizing, if you could explain how your work is contributing to that and what exactly that you're working on. Right. So I think that The main uh, issue in chronic hepatitis C, which is um, 25% of the patient can develop a liver cirrhosis, and which accounts for a majority of HCV-related morbidity and mortality. However, in the past seven years, Mm -hmm. the new innovative uh, antiviral agent for hepatitis C, the direct-acting antiviral agent, which uh, potently inhibit different stages in the viral life cycle, has led to the replacing of the old medication uh, with well-tolerated oral therapies, which has a high cure rates of more than 95% in most patient populations. So this is the main reason why we are really see a decrease in the prevalence of hepatitis C worldwide. Could you tell us a little bit about the antiviral agents that you're working with? Well, as I said, these are they are called the direct acting antiviral agent. They are small, very smart molecules which inhibits. Uh, different uh, stages of the viral life cycles. So they really oppress the viral replication and terminating the viral life cycle. And what can be done to uh, help improve hepatitis C prevention? For the prevention of hepatitis C, for instance, Uh, There is no effective vaccine against uh, the virus. So prevention uh, depends on reducing the risk of exposure to the virus in the healthcare settings and in a high-risk population. Uh, This includes, for example, people who inject drugs and uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, particularly those infected with uh, HIV or uh, those who are taking pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV. So for hepatitis C, the primary preventions as recommended by the WHO include a safe and appropriate use of healthcare injection 
for instance, uh, safe handling and disposals of sharks and, and waste, the uh, provision of comprehensive harm reduction services to people who inject drugs, testing of donated blood for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and really training uh, the health personnel and prevention of exposure to blood uh, during uh, sex. And finally, we go to Scotland to talk about the liver and the microbiome with Dr. James McElroy, CEO of Enterobiotics. Thank you for joining us, James. Could you please give us a brief introduction about yourself and your company? My name is Dr. James McElroy. I'm the founder and CEO at Enterobiotics. I'm a medical doctor by training on a mission to alleviate human suffering through novel medicines that enhance the gut microbiome. I started Enterobiotics as a medical student after becoming fascinated with this new and emerging field of science and medicine relating to the hidden microbial majority that lives on and inside of our bodies. We are all less than 50% human in the context of the numbers of microorganisms that live on and inside of us outnumbering the number of human cells that make us up. I think that the microbiome has massive and largely untapped therapeutic potential. I think that every single person on the planet can benefit through enhancement of their gut microbiome. And what we are doing at Introbiotics is developing a medicine, which I believe has the potential to transform the standard of care for patients suffering from very nasty and serious conditions linked to the gut microbiome. And in doing so, we will be fulfilling that mission of alleviating human suffering at a global scale. I would like to build Enterobiotics into the world's premier full spectrum microbiome therapeutics company. What do I mean by full spectrum? I mean that we capture and harness the natural diversity that exists with inside of other healthy human beings. The colon is by far the most efficient fermenter on the planet. There is nothing that we have created which comes anywhere near the colon. And as such, we're leveraging the colon as the source of the starting material for our drug product. Our lead asset, EBX102, contains pooled communities of microorganisms derived from rigorously screened and exquisitely healthy people. We take those microorganisms through a proprietary manufacturing process which preserves the viability and diversity of the ecosystems whilst ensuring that there are no nasty pathogens present within the source material and that none make their way into the process and ultimately the product through the environment. To facilitate that, we have made early and significant investments into establishing state-of-the-art GMP manufacturing and analytical infrastructure, which gives us control over the supply chain which means that we control our own destiny, but also retain all the knowledge and know-how that we're developing over the course of developing our products within the business. And I feel very strongly about that. We are establishing a global microbiome therapeutic center of excellence here in Scotland. We are growing very quickly with roughly 60 employees at the moment and a large number of open positions. We are hiring. So if there's anyone listening to this that wants to take on hard challenges and ultimately develop a medicine which could replace the standard of care in multiple different disease areas in which traditional intestinal microbiota transfer studies have shown promise, then you should definitely check out the open positions at Enterobiotics. We are a very serious organization that takes what we do very seriously, but we're also having fun whilst we're striving to change the course of medicinal product development through a new field of science and medicine. And what stage are you at with your development and funding at the moment? Where we're at right now in terms of our stage of development is that we've raised roughly £18 million through seed and series A. We are raising series B at the moment with a very strong show of support from the existing shareholder base. We're looking to broaden the cap table with life science specific institutional investors who could support the business moving forwards through crossover towards a potential IPO on the NASDAQ within the next 24 months. Our lead asset is being developed initially in patients suffering from liver cirrhosis and a downstream complication of cirrhosis called hepatic encephalopathy. 
which is a term used to describe a constellation of signs and symptoms relating to cognitive impairment and neuromuscular dysfunction. These patients are desperately unwell and the standard of care is woefully inadequate. There is a 40% mortality at 12 months in patients that have suffered from hepatic encephalopathy that has driven them towards a hospital admission. Interestingly, there have been several randomized controlled trials in which microorganisms have been moved from healthy donors into the intestinal tract of patients suffering from cirrhosis and HE. Could you tell us a little bit about your lead asset and how it helps people with liver disease? And what has been shown is that the procedure and the drug product administered to the procedure has a strong safety and tolerability profile and is driving preliminary signals of efficacy. It is preventing patients who have been hospitalised coming back into hospital which clearly has an impact on quality of life. It has an impact on the healthcare system and society more generally. And if we can prevent patients from deteriorating and ultimately dying, then we have a very strong case for developing a drug in that area. Our strategy at Enterobiotics is to only develop in areas that are supported by strong, what we call IMT precedents. IMT being intestinal microbiota transfer and precedents being randomized controlled clinical studies. We think it is a unique and privileged position to be in as a drug development enterprise. And so far as we have human proof of concept, proof of principle data to inform our development decisions on, we believe that that gives us a accelerated insofar as we don't have to undertake traditional preclinical work and a capital efficient de-risked form of drug development, de-risked being driven by the fact that Microbes have been moved into humans from another healthy human and generated a profile that we think supports development in the area. So there isn't this translational leap of faith from an animal model into humans. It also is accelerated insofar as we think we can go directly into patients if there's a strong enough IMT precedence case to be made. What that means for investors in enterobiotics and for us as a company is that there is a large number of potential indications that we can develop in relatively quickly. And I think that the bigger pharmaceutical companies, although not as heavily invested in the microbiome as I think they will be, will be watching the space carefully. And we should see the first approvals within the next 12 to 24 months with some of the front runners in the field. In contrast to the front runners who are focused on a nasty infection caused by C. difficile. So the liver gut axis is the main focus of your work. Could you explain how the microbiome fits in with all this? We have taken a different approach to enterobiotics and strategically selected the gut-liver-brain axis as being our area of focus, and we want to be the best in the whole world at anything to do with microbiome manipulation in that area. To facilitate that, we've built a strong KOL board with the leaders in the field and are developing a lot of internal know-how relating to pathogenesis and how the microbiome contributes to the disease severity in these areas. What makes us different at enterobiotics, in addition to disease indication selection differentiation, is that we have established, one, control over the supply chain. And for us, that means right the way from initial donor recruitment through to final drug product release. We have made a lot of investment into establishing a robust donor program that's been operating for over four years. We have established a brand that sits on top of the donor program called Number 2 and secure trademark protection internationally for Number 2. In controlling the donor program, we gather unique insights into what makes a good donor and ensures that we always have sufficient quantities of appropriate quality starting material to meet both our research objectives and our manufacturing objectives. We have made early and significant investments into establishing state-of-the-art, bespoke GMP manufacturing and analytical infrastructure that allows us to manufacture our lead asset and follow-on assets, both for us and potential partners moving forward. We also have an entirely differentiated and novel method of manufacturing that forms part of a platform that we call AMPLA. AMPLA means broad spectrum in Latin. Through AMPLA, we're able to dry suspensions of microorganisms much, much faster than anyone else in the world. In addition to that, delivering significant impacts on cost of goods and additional floor plate considerations in regards to GMP manufacturing facilities, we're also starting to build a case for it delivering advantages to the end product. The process is shorter and is less stressful because it doesn't involve multiple fluctuations in temperature, as you would see in traditional methodologies like leophilization and spray drying. When you take the AMPLA platform, 
in the context of the other elements associated with supply chain control, like the number two Port Hall and brand, we think we have the best platform for premier full spectrum microbiome products in the world. In addition to the Ampla platform conferring benefits for us, which are manufacturing, we also think it potentially offers upside potential in the form of entrenching the technology and other microbiome therapeutic strategies and modalities that exist around the world. We believe that the platform could be and probably should be applied to any microbial product that's currently manufactured using lyophilization or spray drying, which are sort of traditional state-of-the-art methodologies. We're exploring how we might achieve that at the moment at Introbiotics and are putting together a business development campaign. And why do you think it is that liver disease is still on the rise, whereas other diseases such as cancer um, are either plateauing or even declining? So I'll take the first question first, and that relates to why is the incidence of liver disease increasing? And why is that increasing at an increasingly high rate when compared to other big disease areas like cancer and cardiovascular disease, which are leading causes of underage mortality in the developed world? My view on that is that the underlying etiology for liver disease is multifactorial. Historically, it was driven primarily by excessive amounts of alcohol consumption. But what we now see is that non-alcoholic fatty changes to the liver are the primary driver for cirrhosis. Um, to give you some context, over the last couple of decades, we have seen a 600% increase in the mortality rates associated with liver disease in the UK. That's in stark contrast to the increases we see in other disease areas like cancer and cardiovascular disease, as I previously mentioned. And what is the main role of the microbiome when it comes to the liver? Why is the microbiome important in liver disease? Well, 70% of the blood that goes to the liver comes from the gut. It is the case that in germ-free animal models, we find it very difficult to insult and injure the liver, which suggests that the microorganisms are fundamental to the pathogenesis and the severity of the disease. And we can map in case control studies where we profile the microbiome between healthy people and patients with liver disease, that there are significant changes to the composition and therefore function of the microbiome between the healthy controls and the patients with disease. We can also prospectively longitudinally map the microbiome over the course of someone's life with liver disease. And we can show that there are specific, measurable and consistent changes to the microbiome that happen over time in patients as they deteriorate over the course of their cirrhosis from someone with a stable form of cirrhosis, such as someone with a MELD score of less than 12, right the way through to someone that has decompensated liver disease and has a bloodstream infection. The changes relate to diversity, but also the relative abundance of pro-inflammatory bacteria that sit within the intestinal tract. In addition to that, we also find large amounts of bacterial DNA in post-mortem analysis of the liver, and we can measure gut membrane, gut epithelial integrity, and that changes over the course of someone that has liver disease as they advance. So what is the case for microbiome modulation in liver disease? Well, I've built the case there for the microbiome being fundamental to the pathogenesis and the severity of the disease. And with regards to modulation, the IMT-FMT studies that have been published to date show really strong safety and tolerability signals in a positive manner and deliver preliminary signals of efficacy. It has been shown that ammonia, which exists in the serum and also is produced by the gut in the microbiome, changes after IMT-FMT administration in a downward trend. Now, ammonia is fundamental to the development of hepatic encephalopathy. It is produced in the gut, and when the liver is functioning properly, it deals with that. But when the liver is cirrhosed and there's increased pressure in the blood vessels leading into the liver, then the liver can't deal with the ammonia properly, and it features in a higher level in the blood, and that causes inflammation in the brain. In addition to that, there are toxins produced by the gut microbiome, particularly when it shifts to a more pro-inflammatory state, that also impact the brain's ability to function. And as a result of that, the neuromuscular function in the body as well. If we can shift the communities of microbes in the intestinal tract towards a less inflammatory state, rebuild the diversity, and in turn, rebuild the functionality. So it starts producing things like short-chain fatty acids, which have a direct impact on the integrity of the epithelial barrier within the small intestine, then it's possible to alleviate symptomatology and potentially prevent the course of disease from progressing. And what exactly is it that you're developing to help with liver disease? 
At Enterobiotics, we're developing EBX102 in patients with cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy. We made that decision because of the size of the unmet clinical need, the strength of the IMT precedents, some preclinical work that's been published, and really the current standard of care, rifaximin, which is a non-systemically absorbed antibiotic, and lactulose, which is a laxative, both directly modulate the microbiome. So the existing paradigm is microbiome modulation, but instead of giving an antibiotic, which has obvious limitations, and a laxative, which also has obvious limitations, we're giving something that enhances the microbiome. Therefore, we think we have an opportunity to completely transform the standard of care in patients with HE and cirrhosis. My ultimate vision for the product is I think that everybody with cirrhosis could receive EBX 101 to enhance their gut microbiome, reduce the numbers of multidrug resistant organisms within the gut, strengthen the gut barrier integrity, and maybe have some other effects that we haven't fully defined, but that are beneficial in nature. Finally, could you give us a brief history of the modulation of the microbiome? Yes. So the concept of modulating the gut microbiome is not new and did not originate in modern times. It dates back a long, long way from where we are now. I can give you a couple of examples. One, Hippocrates is quoted as saying, all disease begins in the gut. And he also said things like, let thy medicine be thy food and thy food be thy medicine. Now, I think we all understand, broadly speaking, what we need to do if we want to become healthier. We eat healthier. We, if we smoke, stop smoking. If we drink a lot of alcohol, we cut that down. We focus on our sleep. We focus on exercise. We maybe spend some time outdoors. So for me, whenever I hear that and think about that, I think that's having a direct impact on the gut microbiome. The happier and more diverse our microbiome is, the more functions that the microbes undertake that benefit the body. So we should always consider when we're eating food, how are our microbes going to feel about us eating this particular food? Now, we can fast forward a little bit and go to fourth century China. There is a clinician. I don't want to do his name a disservice, but this particular clinician prescribed something called yellow dragon soup. And that yellow dragon soup, we believe, was the sort of early, early days of what we now call intestinal microbiota transfer. So whilst this is a novel therapy in the form that companies like Enterobiotics are developing, it has ancient, long-standing tradition. And we've known for a long, long time that the gut, and in particular the gut microbiome, is very important. But we're only just now starting to unravel how we develop a drug successfully and safely within that area. For me, it gives me a lot of confidence in the drug's ability to work because it's been something that's been going on for a long, long time. Additionally, we co-evolved with the microorganisms. I mean, they were on the planet far longer than us. So really, should it come as any surprise that they're fundamental to our health? We've co-evolved together. We feed them they help us. It's a symbiosis. So we're all a walking symbiosis. And microbiomes are not unique to humans. I think everything on the planet that is living probably has a microbiome or some sort of symbiosis if they're a multicellular complicated organism. Horses and cows require microorganisms for various different functions. And actually, the process of moving microorganisms from a healthy horse or cow into a sick horse or cow is well established in the veterinary world. So these facts, I think, all lend towards the notion that the microbiome is fundamental to human health. It has massive, largely untapped therapeutic potential. And I believe that what we're developing at Enterobiotics has the potential to benefit patients all around the world. I am very, very motivated and very driven to successfully execute our drug development programs to achieve the vision that we have, building the premier full-spectrum microbiome therapeutics company and transforming the standard of care for patients and families all around the world battling serious medical conditions linked to the gut microbiome. And that does it for this themed podcast. And it also means we have plenty of interviews to choose from for next week. And as of right now, it looks like those conversations will be with Endogena, Uracare, and the Biotech Growth Trust. 
We'll also have a new weekly feature on the podcast in the not too distant future, and we'll give you more details as soon as we have them. So a bit of a teaser there. My not too distant future includes lunch, so I better get on that and hope that you enjoyed this week's podcast. And so wherever in the world you may be, I hope you have a great week ahead and that you'll join us next time for another Beyond Biotech.